Hey everyone, in this video lecture, we are covering the topic of nucleic acids. To remind ourselves what nucleic acids are, we got to think back to the beginning of this lecture series, looking at the four macromolecules that are necessary for all of life. Every living organism needs these four molecules, which are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and the last one listed here are nucleic acids. So this is one of the important components that all living things must have. So we're going to talk about in this video the structure of it, the function of nucleic acids, and how these are used within a cell. The function of nucleic acids, or really the job of these molecules in cells, are looking at storing genetic information. So we'll see kind of what we mean by that as we go through the structure of it in more detail. Uh, but nucleic acids are what determine what traits an organism or a um, individual has. They also are responsible for building proteins that will then give you those specific traits. So we're gonna look at the structure of these and see how they're relevant to storing genetic information and or building proteins. The really basic structure of all nucleic acids, it follows that monomer polymer structure of the four macromolecules for life. The monomer being the building block or the subunit that's repeated over and over again to build the larger polymer structure, which is our nucleic acid. So the monomer that gets repeated over and over again, the structure is called a nucleotide. We're gonna look at the nucleotides in more detail because they have this sort of three piece structure, um, but they get repeated over and over again to form the larger polymer, which is either going to be the nucleic acid DNA or the nucleic acid RNA. And we'll look at these and compare these two. Um, so these are both types of nucleic acids, depending on the structure of the nucleotides that are repeating. To compare DNA and RNA, the two types of nucleic acids side by side, they have a lot of similarities, but also some stark differences. So the reason they have slightly different names here, so the N and the A stand for nucleic acid in their name, but the first letters are different due to the sugars that make up the nucleotide monomers. In DNA, the sugar base is a deoxyribose sugar, where in RNA, it is ribose. And then again, we'll look at those nucleotide monomers in more detail in a minute, but they have these nitrogenous bases that will make them up. In DNA, there are four nitrogenous bases. In RNA, there are also four, with the exception of RNA does not have the T or thymine nitrogenous base. Instead, it has a U or uracil base. We'll look at the pairing in more detail in a little bit, um, but in terms of the way DNA pairs the nitrogenous bases or the nucleotides together, A's will pair with T's and C's will pair with G's. We'll, we'll see that again as we go into the structure in more detail. And because RNA does not have T's, the pairing is very similar with the exception of A will pair with U. DNA, the structure itself is made up of two strands. It is double stranded, whereas RNA is typically single stranded. It might fold on itself and look double stranded, but in essence, it is really just one strand of repeating nucleotides. So the nucleotides that make up DNA and RNA, again, they have a three-part structure. They both have sugars. The sugars will differ whether it's RNA or DNA. Off the sugar is a phosph phosphate group. And then off the other side of the sugar is that nitrogenous base position. And depending whether it's DNA and RNA, um, we'll determine which, uh, which nitrogenous bases will occupy this position. Um, so let's look at those bases in more detail. So two of our nitrogen spaces are classified as purines. So the structure of them are double uh, carbon-based rings. So that is the guanine and the adenine base. So the G and the A. Both of these nitrogen spaces are found in DNA and in RNA. And then for the, the rest of the nucleotide or nitrogen spaces, they are in the category called pyrimidines, or they form a single carbon base ring. And the pyrimidine bases are cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Cytosine, or the C base, is found in both DNA and RNA, 
uh, nucleic acids, where the T is only found in DNA and the U is only found in RNA. So the fact that these are double rings or single rings is important when it comes to the structure of these larger polymer molecules. So when we look at the way the nucleotides pair, that nitrogenous base spot is really important because it allows our nucleotides to pair in really predictable ways. So the structure will always have pairing of a purine ring with a pyrimidine ring. So here we have adenine, you can see the double ring structure to it, pairing with thymine, which is a single ring. And it's held together by some loose hydrogen bonds. We'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. So because of the structure of these two molecules, A is always going to pair with T, unless we're dealing with RNA nucleotides, and then that T spot would be uracil. And then C will always pair with G. So guanine being a double ring will always pair with cytosine, a single ring. So A, adenine, and C, cytosine would never pair with one another because if you can see here, the little dotted lines indicate the amount of, or the number of hydrogen bonds. So these have two hydrogen bonds holding them together, whereas guanine and cytosine have three. So the chemical structure of A and C will never pair together, same with G and T. And we, it's really important that we have the double ring pairing with a single ring because this will always give us um, equal width of the DNA molecule. You never want A pairing with G because that would be two double rings pairing together. You'd never want T pairing with C because that would be two single rings pairing together. So the shape of these nitrogenous bases and the predictable pairing patterns um, give us a lot of power um, looking at the structure of DNA and how it can be used to interpret the genetic information being stored in it. And when we do have these nucleotides pairing that, the way that they pair, we get this twisted sort of shape to DNA that we call a double helix. Double referring, referring to the fact that it's two strands and twisted uh, to refer to the fact that it is that helix shape. If we look a little bit more at DNA structure zoomed in, if we kind of flatten out those two strands that are paired together, um, we notice that the two strands, the way that they pair is anti-parallel, meaning that the two strands are facing in opposite directions. We could go into five prime and three prime, but really if we just look at the sugar rings here, the sugar rings on the left side of the DNA um, double strands, is kind of pointing upward um, and the same with the phosphates kind of pointing up where if you look at the opposite strand on the right hand side those sugar rings are pointed downward same with the phosphate groups are kind of near the bottom and if you look at the way you know the letters are written here those are upside down as well so the way that the nucleotides pair together one side is facing kind of upright the other side is facing downward so that you know, you can go to upper level science classes, they'll talk about the five prime and three prime ends of DNA. It's really just looking at the way that those sugar rings are facing, which is in opposite directions. Looking at the outside of the DNA molecule, so the inside of the double pair, double strands is your nitrogenous bases pairing together. Whereas the outside of the molecule, you see what we call a phosphate sugar backbone. So the phosphates and the sugars are alternating. So here we have phosphate, then a sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. Um, so those outside edges will alternate between those two um, molecules. The pairing is always being referred to as complementary. We know that if we have an A here in this position, the opposite nucleotide will be a T, again, giving us that double helix shape. And then lastly, holding together those nucleotides are hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are important because they are a weak chemical bond. So that is going to allow the DNA strands to easily pull apart and separate, which is important when it comes to DNA being used to actually create proteins. In terms of the discovery of DNA, there are two kind of famous scientists that were credited with discovering the structure of it, and that is uh, Watson and Crick. They were 
studying the structure of DNA and trying to figure out what is the shape of the molecule. And they were credited with the structure of DNA because they were able to build the 3D structure of DNA. They saw that double helix shape. They saw how those nucleotides were pairing together, where purines were pairing with pyrimidines. However, a little controversy is that their work could not have really been completed without the prior work of Rosalind Franklin and Erwin Chergoff. So Fr Franklin worked in a lab that did x-ray crystallography, which is taking images of the structure of DNA. She created an image that pretty much proved DNA was a double helix shape, and that helix was pretty much even width throughout the entire molecule. And that allowed Chargoff to come up with the rules that A will always pair with T and C will always pair with G to in ensure that the, the width of DNA was even throughout. So Watson and Crick were able to get their hands on this image and take that information about the structure of DNA and put that towards their 3D model and you know, publish that work and get all the credit for the discovery of DNA. But it's important to give credit where credit is due um, to these two people because their work was really the foundation of what we know today about the structure of DNA.